I'm Dr. Michael Stryker, Allen Institute board member and a professor in the Department of Physiology at the University of California, San Francisco. The story of the Allen Institute began nearly two decades ago when founder Paul G. Allen had the vision to do something that had never been done before, to build a genome-wide, high-resolution, 3D atlas of gene expression throughout the adult mouse brain. This was a game changer for the field of neuroscience. Building this atlas required a new approach where scientists worked and collaborated together in teams, team science. They built pipelines to do science at scale, what we call big science. And when they completed the Allen Brouse Brain Atlas, they shared it publicly with the world, open science. Ever since, team, big, and open science have been core principles that drive the Allen Institute's mission to unlock the complexities of bioscience and to advance our knowledge to improve human health. Every day, thousands of scientists around the world use the Allen Mouse Brain Atlas to study everything from Alzheimer's disease and ALS to depression and dementia. Since the completion of that first brain atlas, the Allen Institute for Brain Sciences portfolio of big, team and open science projects has expanded to include the Allen Human Brain Atlas, the Mouse Connectivity Atlas, and the Allen Cell Types database, as well as the MindScope program and the Allen Brain Observatory that have focused on the function of one brain area, the visual cortex. Driven by founder Paul Allen's enduring quest to unravel the complexities of biology, the Allen Institute's research ex areas also expanded. In 2014, the Allen Institute for Cell Science launched with the aim of investigating and modeling the complexity of our cells. The Institute's cell lines, plasmids, models, and tools have opened a new window into the basic building blocks of life, allowing researchers to ask new questions about what makes cells healthy and what goes wrong in disease. 2016 saw the launch of the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group, a new division dedicated to accelerating science through programs such as the Allen Distinguished Investigators and the Allen Discovery Centers, encouraging new ways of doing science and nurturing breakthroughs. In 2018, the Allen Institute for Immunology became the Institute's fourth division. They are working to unravel the mysteries of our immune system, including why some people with COVID-19 have very mild symptoms, while others become very ill and have symptoms that linger for months. All of these divisions are focused on fulfilling the Allen Institute's mission of tackling the hardest problems in bioscience. As the Institute for Brain Science worked to identify the types of cells in the brain and to map their connectivities, Paul also wanted us to find out how the brain works to produce intelligent behavior, to understand the operating system of the brain, as he sometimes put it. His curiosity led the Allen Institute's president and CEO, Alan Jones, to convene planning sessions with outside world experts to figure out how to attack this problem and to refine the candidate approach with a series of workshops. Under his leadership, the vision for the Institute's fifth division came into focus. Today, building on the great work of Allen Institute researchers past and present, we are pleased to announce the next step forward in fulfilling Paul Allen's vision for understanding the brain, the launch of the Allen Institute for Neural Dynamics. Researchers in this new division will explore the brain's neural circuits and electrical activity at the level of individual neurons and the whole brain to reveal how we interpret our environments to make decisions. The division's experiments and openly shared resources 
We'll shed light on behavior, memory, how we handle uncertainty or risk, how we chase rewards, and how some or all of these complex cognitive functions go awry in neuropsychiatric disorders such as depression, ADHD, or addiction. The Allen Institute for Neural Dynamics will be led by Carl Svoboda. Carl is coming to the Allen Institute from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute's Janelia Research Campus, where his lab studies neural circuits and develops new technologies and tools. He was previously a professor at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Bell Labs, and earned his PhD in biophysics from Harvard. He has served as a member of the Allen Institute for Brain Sciences Scientific Advisory Councils during the past 10 years. It is now my great honor and pleasure to introduce the incoming Vice President and Executive Director of the Allen Institute for Neural Dynamics, Carl Svoboda. For the audience, please remember to type your questions into the Q&A window and we will answer those after Carl's presentation. Carl? Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, and thanks to all of you who've joined us uh, today. Um, I'm uh, really excited to be here to celebrate the launch of the Allen Institute for Neurodynamics and tell you more about our mission. So I'm uh, calling uh, today from my new, still bare office at the Allen Institute in Seattle down here in South Lake Union in this gorgeous research building. Here we join other Allen Institutes uh, in doing cutting edge biomedical research. Now, um, as you've heard, the New Allen Institute for Neurodynamics is made possible by the vision and support of our late founder, Paul Allen. And this is really the last major initiative signed off by Paul himself. The New Institute is a major investment in brain research and an incredible and unique opportunity to make substantial advances in understanding the brain. Now we've been planning the institute, new institute for a year and a half, and I'm very excited to tell you about our plans as our vision is taking shape. We're raring to get started. So in the next 20 minutes, I'll give you a bit of background, describe our mission and vision, and sketch out how we plan to organize ourselves. Now, perhaps the first question is, why do we need another effort in brain science? Uh, I think the answer is obvious. Uh, and in a nutshell, the mammalian brain is the most complex system currently under scientific investigation. It's a frontier so vast that we're only beginning uh, to comprehend the brain's intricacies and we scratch the surface on the brain's function. Now, as you know, disorders of the nervous system are widespread and cause enormous suffering and economic damage. Alzheimer's disease itself is already a trillion dollar a year burden on the economy. And I think that we lack mechanistic understanding of how neurons produce moments brain functions. And as a result, treatments of neurolog neurological diseases are largely lacking or have poor efficacy. Now, why are we focused on neurodynamics? Um, as you uh, remember perhaps from physics in high school, Dynamics is about the motion of bodies and substances that respond to forces. Dynamics explains planetary orbits or how water navigates the, the rocky bottom of a brook or how a bicycle works. Now the brain has evolved to produce the amazing behaviors we see in ourselves and other animals. This includes sensation, movements, emotions, memory, consciousness, in fact, all psychological phenomena are produced by our brains. And underlying behavior is a symphony of electrical and chemical signals that flow through networks of neurons in our brain. This flow of signals is what we refer to as neurodynamics. Now, for example, as I speak, sound is absorbed by neurons in your ears and converted into tiny electrical impulses referred to as spikes. These electrical signals then flow through connected chains of neurons in different brain regions in your brain 
ultimately to be extracted from, uh, to extract meaning from spoken language in a specialized brain region referred to as Wernicke's area. Now, based on what you heard, you might act, perhaps reach for your phone to Google something related to the talk to find out more about it. The reaching movement itself is produced by a precisely timed sequence of muscle movements. This also is orchestrated by neurodynamics. In this case, a small avalanche of electrical signals in the motor cortex, perhaps, and then uh, moved on to the spinal cord to activate muscles. Now, importantly, the brain is not a stimulus response machine. It has a mind of its own. Most of the brain's volume is not devoted to inputs and outputs, but to learning and storing models of the world. Let's illustrate this with language comprehension and homophones. These are words that sound identical, but have different meanings. Now, I uh, was born in Prague and referred to myself as Czech. Your brain doesn't get confused and think, hmm, this fellow is a small sheet of paper that orders a bank to pay some money. Instead, the brain interprets language in an effortless manner in real time, in the context of grammar and semantics, both innate and learned. You know that people who call themselves Czechs might live in Prague and so on and so forth. This is just an example to show how interactions with the world are informed by rules, referred to as models that are stored in our brain and that are continuously up graded and, up, uh, and, and, and updated as we learn. Now, model-based predictions are key to our interpretation of sensory input, language comprehension, economic reasoning, navigation, social interactions, and virtually all form of, forms of behavior. And it is these kinds of higher brain functions that we will tackle at the Institutes for Neural Dynamics. Now, all understand systems or organs in the body ultimately explained in terms of the function of specialized cells. Now, it would be surprising if the mammalian brain is much different and classic work from simple nervous systems confirms this point. This slide shows just one well-known example, the swimming circuit of the Tritonia mollusk. Um, one touch of a sea star releases an escape maneuver. The resulting swimming, rhythmic swimming movement is controlled by three neuron circuit in the, black, in the blue box over here. Up here are the patterns of spikes in this three neuron circuit. Each neuron is active at a well-defined phase of the swimming cycle and drives the appropriate muscles downstream. Each neuron in the central pattern generator in the blue box has a well-defined role and is necessary. So this Tritonia circuit is a well-understood well example of neural dynamics in a map neural circuits that circuit that controls a specific behavior, the escape behavior of tritonia. In the mammalian brain, we generally lack understanding at this level of, of uh, at this level of defined cell types and circuits made from defined cell types. Now, this is of course in part because the mammalian brain is orders of magnitude more complex uh, than the nervous system of uh, a mollusk and organized in a different way. Now, fortunately, the last decade has seen great advances in enumerating and characterizing the different cell types that compose the mammalian brain, a parts list of the brain. This is a, in part based on groundbreaking work at the Allen Institute and other initiatives around the world. For example, two weeks ago, the journal Nature contained no less than 17 articles about the brain cell types, many with major contributions from the Allen Institute. For comparison, on a normal good week, there were two or three papers about brain science at large in an issue of Nature. This just illustrates that the progress in assembling the parts list of the brain has been great. Now, the parts list is necessary, but not sufficient to understand how the brain works. The Allen Institute for Neurodynamics exists to build on these efforts, to build on this understanding of the parts list, to understand how different cell types are wired up into circuits and how these brain, uh, cell types collaborate to process information and produce behavior. Now here are a couple of key sections uh, from our mission statement. We'd like to understand how the brain builds understanding of the complex world around us to guide the flexible behaviors that address our biological needs. 
The answers that we're looking for will be in terms of defined neuron types that interact across the whole brain and body. And this is of course, because behaviors are not created or not produced by neurons in one uh, brain area, but connected neurons across multiple brain areas that might span the entire brain. This will require us to develop next generation neurotechnologies because we don't know how to do most of many of the relevant measurements yet and also employ a team-based approach to discovery neuroscience. Teams are essentially multidisciplinary collaborations that are a bit more coordinated than they might otherwise be. And for a complex problem of this magnitude, team-based approaches are appropriate. Now, knowledge, data, and tools that we generate will be widely shared, in part to catalyze research in the scientific community and also to support the development of therapies for brain disorders. So the next 15 minutes or so, I'll put meat on uh, the bone to explain uh, this vision in a little bit more detail. Let's start with behavior. As I've already mentioned, the brain has evolved for behavior, so it needs to be understood in the context of behavior. I'll briefly explain how we will use behavior to learn about fundamental processes in the brain. In terms of behavior, our initial focus will be on foraging. And uh, as you can imagine, foraging, foraging is critical for survival in many guises. Foraging is really about how animals, including humans or even artificial intelligence agents, find resources in their habitat. Let's say you're picking blueberries in the Cascades. How do you optimize your rate of picking blueberries while minimizing effort and danger? Blueberries are distributed in patchy bushes. Over the time, the yield of a patch decreases and you have to decide when to move on uh, to the next bush and abandon the picked over bush. Exploration takes time and energy and thus represents an opportunity cost. You might have to consider the presence of competitors and dangers like the bear over here on the right. Foraging decisions are potentially highly complex. And it turns out that all mammals, even some birds, including mice, appear to solve the foraging problem in a similar and clear, clever manner, also in multiple contexts. So here's the context on a weekend, and this might be during the workday. We have rich mathematical theories of foraging that have been developed as part of behavioral ecology and also economics. For example, a famous result is that the optimal decision to abandon a patch is when the rate of gain from the patch drops below the average rate of gain for the entire habitat. This is also referred to as the marginal value theorem, and you may be aware of similar principles in economics. These theories are important to us because they tell us precisely what kind of problems the brain has to solve to do foraging. We can then look for neural signals in the brain that might reflect the underlying algorithms. So foraging animals weigh rewards, risks, and their own needs, like hunger and thirst to make decisions. Our studies will reveal how brains create statistical models of uh, the environment to make decisions during foraging. Now, foraging requires memory over multiple timescales. Animals have to keep track of the value of the patch of the current blueberry bush typically over seconds to minutes. But moreover, to calculate the relative value of the patch, the subject needs to know about the entire habitat. And this is, of course, acquired over experience, over hours to days, perhaps an entire lifetime. We hope that our studies will reveal how these memories are made, updated, and made, uh, updated maintained, and made. Finally, animals learn to navigate new habitats faster than modern AI systems and understanding the neural mechanisms or at least the neural architecture underlying foraging might advance machine learning and AI. Now the neural processes related to needs, risks and rewards are linked to the brain's neuromodulators, dopamine, serotonin and others. We know that neurons Producing these neuromodulators are few in numbers, but they have a disproportionate effect on the brain and behavior. They shape how signals are distributed across the brain, how signals flow through brain areas during behavior. And as a result, neuromodulator systems are the target of most drugs for the treatment of neuropsychiatric disorders. Our studies will reveal how neuromodulator systems shape our responses to reward, uncertainty, and danger 
and may advance the treatment of neuropsychiatric disorders. Now, understanding how neurodynamics supports behaviors such as foraging requires direct measurements of activity during those behaviors. And this is extremely challenging, of course, because these neural signals have to be measured in the intact brain. And underlying the brain's unassuming exterior lies vast complexity. So the human brain itself has about 100 billion neurons. This is about the number of stars in the Milky Way. The mouse brain still contains 100 million neurons. Each neuron in the brain connects to thousands of other neurons. They might be on the order of a thousand different cell types in the brain. Neurons fire action potentials or spikes depicted, depicted here as flashes of light. An electrical spike in one neuron influences the likelihood that another neuron fires a spike. And this is how neural signals are propagated through neural networks. It's these fleeting patterns of electrical signals that are neurodynamics that underlie all of our mental processes. Now, luckily, uh, the measurements for neurodynamics have undergone a revolution, undergoing a, uh, a revolution, and we have contributed to this development together also with MindScope at the Allen Brain Institute. And we, have, we will continue to drive these technologies forward. For example, we can now measure the activity of a substantial proportion of neurons in multiple brain regions simultaneously using electrical measurements or microscopes. This particular method shown here involves powerful microscopes that are driven by modern laser physics. The bright flashes in this movie corresponds to single active neurons. We can extract the pixels corresponding to each neuron using computer algorithms. The neuronal brightness as a function of time correspond to these lines here, then is a measure of neural activity. And we can do this for thousands of neurons. These movies then reveal the symphony of electrical and chemical signals uh, that course for our brains as we think. You can see neurons that are transiently active, other neurons that are more persistently active that might, for example, correlate with uh, short-term memories. These data are rich and enormously complex. They contain information about the interactions between neurons and how the activity patterns relate to behavior. One of our challenges, and really a challenge for the field, is to employ data science, machine learning, and theory to understand how neurodynamics is produced by neural networks and how it is linked to behavior. As a, a concrete, a bit of a toy example, we can extract, uh, we can extract um, uh, neurons that uh, employ a kind of uh, memory. Uh, this memory here is about the value of a particular choice. We know this because in the laboratory, we can control the value of particular choices by manipulating the sizes of rewards, the sizes and frequencies of rewards related to particular choices. So for example, uh, for these uh, neurons, uh, the red curve might reflect neural activity early in a blueberry patch when reward blueberries are abundant. The blue curve is late in a patch when the fruit is mostly consumed and the forager is likely to abandon the patch for another. This neural activity rep represents a memory of the current value of the patch. It's a critical component of solving the foraging problem, a, a critical a component of the internal model that the animal has to build to solve the foraging problem. Now, these observations are just the tip of the iceberg. We'd like to know, for example, how this signal is maintained over tens of seconds. This is a mystery to neuroscientists because we know from biophysical measurements that individual neurons in isolation maintain information only for milliseconds. That's the blink of an eye or less. So memory, the memory-related activity that you see here that is maintained over tens of seconds has to be an emergent property of specific neurons connected into uh, structured neural circuits. How are these memories of value updated when a reward is smaller or larger than expected? How does this memory of value ultimately determine a choice and a movement that makes sense to the animal? For example, to depart to a new patch if the value of the current patch is low, for example, when you're in this state corresponding to the blue curve. We think that to answer these and other deep questions, we have to consider the many neuron types in the brain. And the shapes of real neurons will convince you that 
that they have specific functions because different neuron types connect to each other in specific ways and likely do different things, like the different cell types in tritonia. So this neuron here is in the cortex and the spindly ball of spaghetti down here in the out, is the output side of the neuron where it connects to a send signals to these neurons down here that are not shown. These neurons in turn send signals back up here to the neuron in the cortex. One hypothesis is that memory-related activity is maintained in signals going back and forth uh, in a loop-like fashion, like a long rally in a tennis game. Now, nearby neurons here in the motor cortex, in particular, like the magenta neuron, send outputs to motor centers that control our muscles. For example, muscles that are related to uh, consumption of food or, or neurons that control orienting behaviors that might be critical for navigating to a different patch in the blueberry field. It is these neurons that are likely critical for initiating and shaping our movements. Other nearby neurons are a bit mysterious. They send their output to many, many other brain areas, ostensibly involved in other kinds of behaviors, perhaps to coordinate different aspects of behavior under certain conditions, but this is speculation at this point. Yet nearby, other nearby neurons, like the green neurons, send dense output to brain regions that is known to be involved in learning. So the neuron is up here, and the output of the neuron is down here. There, these neurons overlap with neurons that produce dopamine. So the dopaminergic neuron is orange down here with its output overlapping the green neuron. The molecule dopamine is thought to trigger changes in the connections between neurons, depending on recent events. More dopamine release if things are going better than expected and less if things are going worse. Dopamine is a kind of teaching signal for circuits. This part of the neural circuit could be key to continuously update the brain's model of the world during foraging. And these diverse and complex neurons of the brain are typical. They show that behavior is not localized to a small part of the brain, but is the result of brain regions interacting across the brain. Now, major limitation uh, of current approaches to measuring and analyzing neural signals is that they are mostly blind to the types of neurons recorded. We think that to learn how the brain's neural circuits produce neural dynamics, we have to record neural activity with reference to these different neuron types that I just showed, that are showed and the many other neuron types in the brain. And this is a key technology goal of our institute. Let me just illustrate that with, um, uh, in the context of another highly, um, highly multiplex measurement of neural activity. This method involves thousands of electrodes that, are directly, that directly detect electrical spikes uh, arising from many neurons. We aim to develop efficient technologies to use the recorded neuron type, which is illustrated here. This is aspirational uh, by the color-coded spikes. And such technologies will be critical to understand how neural circuits implement neural dynamics and produce behavior. A bit about organization. So Paul Allen challenged us to go after hard problems with broad impact, problems that demand a long time horizon and unlikely to be addressed elsewhere in exactly the same way. And I believe we're checking those boxes. Now, Paul was also interested in organizing science to address, organizing science in different ways to address the hard problems. For example, by building multidisciplinary teams that work in a coordinated manner. And we have the freedom to organize our institute in novel ways to maximize our cha chances to, to achieve our ambitious goals. So we're building teams that will create new technologies. This is because the field does not yet know how to do the measurements that we need to do. An important aspect of our tool development will be scientific computing to make data accessible as quickly as possible for large scale data analysis. This is for researchers in our institute but also for the benefit of the scientific community at large. One major goal is to minimize the loop between experiment and analysis so that the analysis can influence and focus subsequent experiments. We think this is critical to zoom in to discoveries in an efficient manner. We're building platforms that will allow us to do unique measurements and analysis in an efficient and integrated way. This includes measurement of neural dynamics uh, in a cell type specific manner and in un unprecedented scales, 
mapping the connections be between neurons across the entire brain, and uh, analysis and theory to compare our data to theoretical models and to derive new models ultimately. Finally, our scientists will organize into multidisciplinary teams and these teams will unleash our technologies and platforms to test theories of brain function and to make hopefully fundamental discoveries. So I'll finish with our big picture aspirations. So in science, we'd like to discover how neural circuits perform computations and learn. We'd like to develop ultimately widely used technologies to explore neurodynamics in the context of defined cell types and structured circuits. And we want to do science with broad impact that meets the deletion test. So broad impact means science that others will build on. And the deletion test refers to science that is a bit orthogonal to what is done elsewhere that isn't done uh, at other places or isn't done in the same way in other places. How do we build our culture? We'd like to create a team-based model for discovery science. We want to share data and reagents and tools as widely as possible to catalyze research across the scientific community. This is, of course, already part of the DNA of the Allen Institutes, and we want to build on that tradition. Finally, uh, the individuals who join us are key. People are key. Uh, young scientists will, uh, uh, will, will, will devote important parts of their career uh, to our mission. So we'd like to organize, we will organize an outstanding environment for developing the careers of young scientists and nurture a diverse scientific uh, community. So let me thank you again for joining me on this super exciting occasion. It's been a privilege to share our vision with you. Please get in touch with feedback and ideas or suggestions. We'd like to hear from you. Our team is excited to begin our research and we look forward to sharing our knowledge and impact with you in the near future. Now stick around for a bit of discussion and Michael Stryker will lead the question and answer period. Yeah, well, thanks for that overview, Carl. I see that our audience has some questions they'd like to ask, but I'd like to start off by asking some specifics about the research you described and its impact. First, I'd, I'd like to ask, is the Allen Institute for Neural Dynamics primarily about fundamental research or mainly driven by its potential impact on biomedicine? Yeah, so this is an important question. We are, the Allen Institute for Neural Dynamics is primarily about foundational research. Uh, we think that understanding the fundamental processes that make our brains work is of inherent interest, like uh, the understanding of the solar system or the universe. And of course, history shows, right, that today's fundamental research in biology is where the next biomedical revolutions come from. This is clear from very recent history, if you think about CRISPR or this year's Nobel Prize. And so we also feel that across research institutions, fundamental research with a long time horizon is relatively underappreciated and underfunded perhaps compared to its impact. Now, if we see, of course, opportunities for translation, we will pursue that likely in collaboration with other, other entities. So we'll be very interested in translating our insights into uh, medicine if these opportunities arise. So what are some specific long-standing open questions that you hope to answer? Well, the, the, um, I've, I've pointed to a couple of them. One of them is, for example, uh, mechanisms of uh, memory um, and at the, at the brain-wide scale. How does the br brain uh, learn? How does the brain uh, maintain information? There are different forms of memory based on lots of very, very kind of a rich prior literature. Let's consider shorter memory over time scales of seconds, perhaps minutes. It's kind of the scratch pad of the brain where we can hold a few items in memory uh, to compare to incoming um, sensory information to make decisions. We'd like to identify the neural substrates and the mechanisms of how these memories are stored. 
Um, and uh, as you know, uh, this has to be, uh, there, there are lots of models of short-term memory around, uh, none of them uh, terribly satisfying. We think that by finding exactly the more neurons that store short-term memories and how they're connected and how activity is passed on from neuron to neuron while short-term memories are maintained will give us a mechanistic understanding underlying these uh, memories. Yeah, but Carol, there, 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 Carol, there are just so many neurons. They're like the stars in the sky. So how will you know that you're studying the right neurons that are relevant to the memory or to the behavior that you're yeah. interested in? Yeah, that's, that's the proverbial uh, uh, needle in the haystack problem. And uh, this is something that has uh, plagued in some sense, the mammalian neuron science for a long time. And I think that is slowly going away uh, because we have much more efficient ways to probe the neural activity of neurons on a brain-wide scale and to also detect the activity of very sparse neurons. So we think we will find the neurons if they're around, but uh, there are there are um, uh, there are some conceptual issues. Um, for example, uh, if we find neurons that, uh, how do we identify the neurons that, for example, uh, hold a short-term memory? Uh, can we recognize their messages? It could be that the uh, neurons uh, only store memories as an ensemble; that individual neurons sort of fluctuate, but together. Uh, they maintain uh, memories of, for example, value during foraging. In fact, I played a little trick on you. The uh, example of um, representation of value, uh, it's a kind of short-term memory in the um, experiment that I highlighted um, earlier, is actually the result of a population analysis of neurons. It's a sparse subset of neurons, but individual neurons go up and down. It's the population of neurons that holds a stable memory. And luckily, there are, uh, there's a relatively vigorous effort right now in theory and computational neuroscience. A uh, group of folks are really uh, developing very interesting methods to extract these kinds of signals also from populations of neurons. Lots to be done, but exciting work is ongoing. Yeah, but, you know, we are all individuals and, you know, mice aren't identical little computers. They're probably all individuals too. How are you going to, how would you, how do you know that what you find in one subject will be the same in, in others? Yeah, um, again, uh, we often wonder about this. How do we study individual brains in individual animals? And even in isogenic animals, say uh, mice, which are like identical twins, essentially we find that individuals are different just from a behavioral standpoint. There are lazy mice, diligent mice, aggressive mice, docile mice, anxious mice, confident mice. And um, um, I, I, I think that again, Ba uh, based on uh, these um, highly efficient ways of recording activity at the level of individual animals, we can uh, perhaps find out how uh, the uh, neural dynamics at the level of individual animals might uh, uh, relate to these different uh, behaviors of individuals. There's a perhaps a second uh, question kind of um, uh, uh, in, in the subtext here, and that's, let's say uh, we have mice that behave identically. Um, could it be that in the middle of the brain, individuals through learning might solve the identical task, even if the behavior and the temperament of the mice is identical using different brain regions? Again, we don't know the answer to that, uh, but it's the kind of thing that uh, we will be able to find out. So are you going to test the ideas that you develop from recording and studying these neurons? How, how can you tell if you got it right? Yeah, so there are, there are, uh, there are to close the loop, uh, one of the key uh, kind of arrows in a quiver is um, um, also uh, access uh, to specific cell types, to manipulate specific cell types. So this is sort of one uh, important way of doing that. So um, uh, you, um, it, if we in identified cell types uh, recognize, for example, a signal that um, 
we think uh, drives specific aspect of behavior, we can go in and then manipulate the activity of the neurons that can be done now using small molecule uh, drugs or um, uh, even uh, light uh, to manipulate uh, the activity of these neurons over different time scales. So you can literally uh, write, not just read activity from neurons, but also with, with some limitations, write activity in neurons and to neuron populations. So you're making predictions then manipulate the activity of uh, neurons to uh, see uh, what the effect is on uh, the rest of the neural circuit and ultimately on behavior. And, and that, I, I think, once you close this loop, I think you have a pretty good idea handle that the signals that you um, uh, interpret to mean X actually mean X. So Carl, what prospect do you see for taking some of the tools that you're working on and helping to develop in mice? What prospect do you see for using those for human illness? Yeah, so in, 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 in terms of tools, there are kind of multiple threats and it's uh, a bit uh, premature, uh, but let's just speculate. Uh, human uh, neurophysiology um, is uh, gaining a lot of traction. Uh, during surgery, surgeons often want to figure out, for example, with the locus of a particular um, uh, ep epileptic focus is, they use electrophysiology uh, to determine that some of the, uh, the physiological methods that we uh, uh, will hope to develop will, will develop will help uh, might help in localizing these uh, these uh, loci uh, during surgery. Uh, we're going to develop a reagents that um, uh, target uh, specific cell types in the brain in collaboration with the Allen Institute for Brain Science that could then uh, be used to manipulate uh, specific subtypes, types of neurons that go uh, wrong in um, uh, neurological disorders. These are just two examples of where uh, this uh, might go. And of course, um, the other direction is if we learn, for example, that particular neuromodulatory neurons, neur neuromodulators, uh, the neuromodulator system much much more complex than uh, we we thought just recently. If we can identify subtypes of neuromodulatory neurons that uh, uh, provide particular signals uh, to the brain, say about fear or about uncertainty, they might be particularly good targets for, manipula for manipulation in certain neuropsychiatric disorders. So that could be okay. another direction where we could have. Yeah. Thank you. So I wanna get to some of the questions from the audience. Um, one question is, the first one is, can you please summarize the difference between the research focus of the Allen Institute for Neurodynamics and the research focus of the Institute for Brain Science? Yeah, so this is a this is a good question. The uh, Brain Science Institute is mainly focused on uh, creating atlases and resources related to the um, cell types of the brain and connections in the brain. It's more about uh, structure, and we are more about uh, dynamics, about how signals flow through neural circuits. So there will be a close collaboration, a lot of interactions. Uh, one is more about the components, how they're connected. We're also going to fill in important parts about how neurons are connected because that's a huge uh, task and we'll contribute to that. And then we'll focus heavily on how signals are propagated through neural circuits to produce what we refer to as computation ultimately uh, for uh, behavior. Yeah. Thanks for that question. So one of our watchers on YouTube has asked, if you take money out of the question, is the current technology and research method that, that you will work on enough to achieve a complete model of the brain in a few decades? Um, I don't know what a complete model of the brain is. We have to uh, make a model of, uh, and, and, and what a model of the brain is. So specifically, we're interested in models of behavior in terms of neural dynamics in neural circuits in the context of behaviors that are rich enough that, that we think we'll learn something general about uh, the human and the mammalian brain. 
Um, and then, of course, uh, we'll, that, that will be built on uh, by uh, many others, uh, the community of brain researchers, and really, uh, you know, generalization will, uh, will, will follow from these uh, many follow-up uh, studies and other uh, studies. I see. So, uh, Susu Chen asked, how, the, how will the new institute take strategic plans to support the career development of young scientists? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so the, um, uh, so we are a 15 year in endeavor. And um, so we are um, basically, um, uh, so we have to think about what our scientists who might just have finished a PhD or postdoc um, how they will develop their career. So we will help them uh, prepare for either um, uh, career trajectories in uh, either biotech or academia, or uh, perhaps continued uh, uh, employment at the Allen Institute for Neuroscience. And we'll build this kind of mentoring into our um, annual cadence um, so that um, you know, uh, young scientists know learn about different opportunities, uh, uh, learn the appropriate uh, skills to uh, follow, uh, uh, to develop uh, skills that will kind of place them into uh, kind of a career path of uh, their choice. So uh, another question is, will the new institute primarily use mouse models or humans or other species? We will start with uh, a focus on the mouse. And the reason for that is that we, uh, the mouse, it, we're building on a huge foundation uh, with uh, um, uh, the amazing resources that the community has developed, a huge knowledge base of uh, cell types and connections uh, in, in particular from the Alliance for Brain Science. And then, um, um, uh, so right now, the mouse, in some sense, among mammals, is the only game in town uh, with the appropriate armamentarium uh, experimentally to achieve the kind of knowledge that we're after. Going forward, uh, of course, uh, we'd like to compare um, uh, what we found uh, to other species. So some of the findings are directly translatable to uh, primates. Uh, we are also thinking about how to develop behavioral paradigms that can be uh, done both in mice and in uh, humans in parallel, so to compare and contrast. So I think we have time for maybe two more questions. And uh, one question is, will the Institute for Neural Dynamics measure its success primarily in the creation and release of public data sets? or instead in terms of scientific discoveries? We will, be, we will measure ourselves uh, based on scientific discoveries. Um, and I think scientific discoveries are tied to um, also distributing public data sets. Um, because I think exploring and exploiting uh, the uh, data sets that we will acquire will require uh, uh, community uh, input. So these are tight, but really the uh, ultimately the measure of success is discoveries that stand the test of time and that will make it into textbooks. Okay, thank you for uh, Carl. So I, um, I guess we just have time for one more question, which is how can the study of neural dynamics illuminate the problem of consciousness? That is something I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and um, I will think about, um, and uh, maybe in a couple of years, I'll have, a, um, I'll have an answer to that. And I have some colleagues at the Allen Institute for Neural, uh, at, the, at, at the MindScope Institute. Um, it's also part of the Allen Institute for, uh, the Allen Institute for Science that will help me think about that. Okay. Well, thank you, Carl. We're just incredibly excited to follow along as the Allen Institute for Neural Dynamics begins to tackle these complex and important questions about the brain. 
Thank you as well to everyone in the audience for joining us here today and for your thoughtful questions. We appreciate your spending an hour with us to celebrate this new chapter for the Allen Institute. Thank you also to the teams at the Allen Institute who make this work possible. And special thanks to the Allen Institute board chair for leading the Institute into the future. We honor Paul's vision and deep commitment to science, and we're on the brink of many exciting discoveries and ultimately a deeper knowledge of how the brain works, which will have meaningful impact on human health and disease. Have a wonderful rest of your day.